Once the vote had been taken and they decided to remove the dam, it was decided that it was really important to make sure that the dam was not forgotten. Sometimes we get labeled as uh, destroying history when we take out one of these dams. And I, I think it's something quite different than that because there were Native Americans that fished there on those banks for these fish, the same kind of fish, thousands of, for thousands of years, thousands of years before us. The memory you have of a dam is a wonderful memory. It's a memory of your childhood. Don't dismiss it, don't, don't, don't leave it. But look at what we have in this place and embrace that also. Article 8. On the petition of Thomas Stanek and others, received the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,786,758 for the purpose of removing the Great Dam, restoring the Exeter River, and to authorize the issuance of not more than $1,786,758 of bonds. In 2014, the town voted with a vast majority to remove the Great Dam, starting a new chapter for the river and for the downtown. But the story of its removal began much earlier than that. In 2000, our Dam Bureau gave a letter of deficiency, which is meaning that, that there's a problem with your dam. And in that, they said you need to fix these aspects because they currently don't meet modern safety. Uh, requirements of, a, of the, this kind of dam. So the town began to discuss that. About the same time, uh, there were a number of forces going on looking at uh, flooding within the town. So the, the two things that really got the ball rolling in this, uh, it wasn't the fish, it wasn't the, you know, the, the ecological values, it wasn't all of that. What really got it rolling was really the flooding issue and this issue of the dam. We had the Great Mother's Day flood of 2006, and I think the next year we had the uh, Patriot's Day storms. <clears throat> These were somewhere in what they call 100-year storms. And they cause a significant amount of flooding, uh, stress on the bridge. Uh, I know uh, there was a time in the Mother's Day storm, there was concern that the bridge uh, was, uh, was in peril, the Great Bridge. So modern safety requirements of a dam mean you have to pass a certain kind of storm. So people are usually familiar with hearing the term, oh, that's a 100-year storm. Well, that's the kind of storm that happens on average 1% uh, every year. You could have a 1% chance of having that. It's a probability. And Dams, especially a high hazard dam, that is a dam that will cause either human or, or infrastructure damage should it fail, they're required by state law to meet certain safety requirements. Some of those safety requirements are about how big a storm can you pass through the spillway of the dam. That's the, where the, most of the water is coming over. And in this particular case, because of the age of the dam and the structure itself, it was not possible to pass that kind of storm. And so big repairs were going to be needed on the dam. Uh, and then that's what really got people talking, is that this is going to be really expensive. So let's take a look at what else can we think about here. The town tasked the River Study Committee to work with local, state, and federal government officials and experts to find a solution to the dam. And we had a lot of studies and a lot of different alternatives. And we narrowed it down to uh, four, actually four alternatives. One was doing nothing. One was that particular, that uh, the dam that would hydraulically, hydraulically uh, lower, uh, raise and lower. One was taking down the dam partially. One was uh, reinforcing the dam by drilling holes into the dam and reinforcing it with, with pipe and concrete. 
And as we walked through them, none of them really were appealing or uh, efficient or financially feasible. Uh, and one gentleman in the committee, and I could give a lot of credit to Peter Richardson. Peter says, well, there's another option to fixing the dam. And everyone turned to Peter and says, what is that? He says, remove it. Never thought about that. So that launched another series of studies on what that meant to remove the dam. And as a result, through many studies and, and commitments by, by extra taxpayers uh, who funded a lot of these uh, studies, uh, we came to the conclusion that the best overall uh, cure or remedy for what we had to do was removal of the dam. With the decision made to remove the dam, people in town were worried about losing such a historic structure. After all, the dams built on this location are what enabled the town to grow from its early beginnings through the Industrial Revolution. The first dams on the river in that location were, of course, grist mills. You had to create food. Europeans eat bread, and so they need flour for bread. The dams as, that we know them up by Great, up, the one we call the Great Dam, probably the first one was lumber mills. And then if you look at the map of 1802 that was made by Phineas Merrill, what you will see is in that, that tiny space between uh, the Great Bridge and String Bridge, and just below String Bridge, there's a series of different mills there. There's all sorts of industries that are taking place there. There's, there's grist mills and uh, iron mills, fulling mills, oil mills where they're squeezing linseed oil. There's all sorts of things that are going on in that area. And that's, that was the state of uh, the industries that were centered around that particular part of town until about, see, about 1827, when a company called the Exeter Mill and Power Company is created. And they start buying up all the water rights as you go up the Exeter River. The purpose for which was to create a giant textile mill in the downtown, which they did in 1831. And that becomes the Exeter Manufacturing Company, or what most people know of as the Exeter Mill today. And from about 1831 on, the story of the dam becomes the story of the Exeter Manufacturing Company. You know, we, we went from a, a town that was settled by a group of religious dissenters, and then we became a lumber town. If you're a lumber town, you need mills to, to of course, mill your lumber. Um, and of course, food products were produced that way. But those were all still very local. When the Exeter Manufacturing Company comes in, that is where we place ourselves in the Industrial Revolution that was taking place all across New England. And in similar ways to the, to the mill towns that you find in Massachusetts, the large ones, it, it, um, it shows you how the population works and where they work. There were whole groups of people that had to live within five minutes of the Exeter Manufacturing Company. They were required to do that by their job. The mill itself had a bell in it that kept time for the day. Uh, it changes the whole pace of life. Without the ability to have that water power, we may not have had such a heavy step in the uh, Industrial Revolution. Industry continued to grow well into the 20th century and became a source of pride for the town. The mills were even featured in the national series, The March of Times. The principal employment of the town comes from its few factories, most of them small. But the Wise Shoe Company employs 350, has a weekly payroll of $8,500. And Hervey Kent's Cotton Mill hires 334 hands and pays them about $7,500 every Saturday. Most of the employees have worked for the Kents for many years. They have no union and there has never been any labor trouble. Hervey Kent is considered Exeter's most substantial... The industrial growth brought about by harnessing the power of the river was not without its own consequences. As early as 1795, 
Samuel Tenney, a doctor who served in the American Revolution, was living in town and he had already noticed that the shad and the alewives were slowing down. They, they hardly ever come up the river anymore, he said. And he completely lists because, uh, he, he says right out that it is because of the dams and there is no way that they can get up past the dams to go and breed. So that was recognized pretty early on. This is one of the longest dammed locations in New England, if not North America. There's a lot that were built in that area, but this was one of them. And this wasn't the original dam, but there's been a dam here for all those years. Um, I believe in the 19s, I can't remember what year it went in, but there was a fish ladder here. And it was a modern fish ladder, but someone didn't tell the fish. And not many fish were going through the fish ladder. The New Hampshire Fish and Game tried every adjustment possible on the fish ladder, and they still were seeing thousands of fish downstream of the dam that wouldn't enter it and go up through the fish ladder. So we knew fish were here, and we knew they, a number of fish wanted to get over, and they were going over. But this fish run was sometimes seeing 2,000 fish a year, only making it up. Some years, zero. I think their highest ever was 8,000. When they've been estimating, sometimes tens of thousands of fish below the dam that weren't making it over. We knew there were fish here, we knew that they wanted to get over, they just weren't making it. In the times before man-made structures were built along the rivers, these fish would start coming inland from large schools of fish that lived in the Gulf of Maine. They swam their way up the Piscataqua River, through Great Bay, and up the Swampscott. They then climbed up and over the Great Falls to breed in the fresh water of the Exeter River. They brought with them nutrients from the ocean, absorbed in their bodies, which were crucial for many species of birds, mammals, and even other fish. During their journey from sea to spawn, they fed striped bass, bluefish, and cod. Seals, seabirds, and otters joined the feast. When tribes of people discovered the falls, they too began using the resource, catching the fish at the falls using weirs. Yeah, the best way to catch, a, catch an alewife or a herring uh, is to use a weir. A weir is like a, um, it's a fish trap, and it, it looks like a series of fences that are sunk into the water, and the fish can swim in, and then they have difficulty swimming out. The natives use this all the time, and in fact, in the earliest document that we have, the agreement that was made between John Wheelwright and the natives when he first got here, it's called the Wheelwright deed, it was signed in 1638. One of the things that is protected are the weirs. Uh, that, that any of the natives have set in the river, that the Europeans were not allowed to touch those. And later on in, um, in Exeter itself, that's one of the earliest parts of the Exeter records in 1640, it again says, the creeks are considered free, and if you put in a weir, you have the rights to that during fishing time, which I think really clearly indicates that this is during a fish run. Um, and although no one is allowed to, um, to, pro to do anything with your fishing weir, you can set one above or below, and the, and the rivers are free. So you can't just claim up all the rights, as happened later with the Exeter Manufacturing Company. Even with all the modern pressures on the river, people continue to use the resource. But this dam project had the potential to help increase the numbers of fish bringing back an animal that was once considered so important that it was put on the official town seal instead of the bandstand. It happens after the bandstand is created, so that's kind of unusual. It seems to trace to the 1920s when the town needed some sort of seal for documents and, uh, and such. And th you know, the best we have is this little news article from the 19. 30s, from 1930s, exactly. And it tells us that a few years back, so they're not even good about exactly when it happened, we needed it a town seal, and so someone drew one up and created it, and they put the alewife on it rather than the bandstand, which was kind of surprising. So they must have felt that this, this fish was something that tied the town all the way back to its earliest days, that the, the 
You could always, this dependable fish that would come up the river, even when it couldn't make it all the way in, was still something, maybe it's persistence or perseverance was something that they felt was you know, a good symbol for the town of Exeter. The, the, the herring population has diminished over time in the eastern seaboard. And for a lot of reasons, some say it's overfishing uh, by, uh, by these large trawlers out, out of the sea. Some talk about maybe pollution, the whole climate change uh, issue. So I think it's important that we try to, you know, give them an environment that they can survive and they need fresh water to spawn. The dam had been stopping many fish from making it into the fresh water of the Exeter. On top of being a physical barrier to fish passage, it also led to a buildup of sediments, starving the Squamscot of nutrients from further up the system. The slow moving pace of the river caused the water behind the impoundment to heat up decreasing oxygen levels and lowering water quality. By removing the dam, the fish would be free to migrate. The water would flow cooler and faster. There would be more oxygen from the water splashing over the newly formed rapids. This would help to create better habitat for fish and higher water quality for us, making it easier to treat. I mean, the herring that come back upriver are, have come back up this particular river for several years. Uh, whatever su survives the spawn, the new fish come back down river into the ocean, will return to this particular fresh water. There's a imp chemical imprint to these type of fish, the herring and alewives, that make them return to their place of origin. So alewives or herring born in the upper reaches of the lamprey, return to the lamprey. The ones of the extra and Squamscot return to the extra and Squamscot. After the vote in 2014, residents in Exeter finally had to grapple with the fact that they were going to lose the Great Dam. Once the vote had been taken and they decided to remove the dam, it was decided that it was really important to make sure that the dam was not forgotten. And so we had a series of public meetings just to gauge what the public felt about the fact that we were losing this structure. And um, it was a process, I wasn't sure how it was going to go, that was, it had been a very difficult decision to decide whether or not to remove the dam. And I think that the, the central question was, is the dam, it, the structure itself, an important historical resource? Is that structure itself so important that we need to preserve it? And ultimately, with the town of Exeter, which is a town that formed because of the river, because of the waterfalls, we had to decide that it was actually the river that made the town and not the dam that made the town. With the decision made, the water was diverted and drained in early July of 2016 to prepare the dam for deconstruction. Over the next few months, the historic Great Dam was broken apart, piece by piece.
as the construction continued, the weather and lack of rain made people question if they had made the right decision. As we started the process, we, little did we know we were entering into one of the most, one of the severest droughts the state of New Hampshire has had in the last 40 or 50 years. And I know from my perspective, as we started taking down the dam and the water behind, the river became narrower and narrower and less water because of the drought. I was like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, I mean, all these, all these fears that people were talking about maybe are coming to fruition. The fact that we removed the dam under drought conditions was kind of a double-edged sword. And I'd say on the balance though, it was a positive thing because it allowed us to do the work without having a lot of water quality issues. So when we're working in rivers, we get really concerned about um, stirring up sediment and creating turbidity because that's, that's essentially water pollution. So the fact that the water was so low allowed us to work relatively cleanly and allowed the contractor to move relatively efficiently rather than having to really manage that water. Um, but once the dam was removed and the river was low, that was a concern. We wanted to see what the river would look like under typical flow conditions. As the construction work came to a close, the river slowly came back and residents were getting their first glimpse of a free-flowing Exeter River. Now there's rapids there. Uh, people now, I've had people come to me and say, you know, I was totally against this. But now that I see what it's like, I think it's beautiful. Not only does it look great, it sounds wonderful. And that's the thing, as you get close to it, you can hear the rapids, you can hear the water moving. So it's, it's taken some adjustment, but I think a lot of people have come around. Those involved in the removal began now to look forward. NOAA, Fish and Game, and other local groups began monitoring fish passage and water flow. The idea is to try to put back a natural fish passage as natural as can be. Now obviously this, you know, the city is encroached on the river, there's walls, there's businesses, there's the library, there's bridges. All of that is made for a system that's not truly natural, but what is being built and what's going to be uh, over time maintained is something that mimics nature very much. And so I think that the, the prospect for fish is quite good here. As people look to the future of the river, it's also a time for some to look back on its rich history and the way in which we're going to remember the dam. We had a series of meetings in the spring of 2013, 2015, to decide how we were going to remember the dam once it was gone. And I was very surprised to find out that what they felt was important was that they didn't want to lose all of the dam. They wanted parts of it to stay. And it became very clear throughout the course of the meetings that we needed to retain some element of the dam and not just put up a plaque and not just put up signs, but we had to be sure that there was something there left. So we decided to keep the headworks and the opening to the, um, the penstock so that that would still be there. And that was surprisingly very important to people. You know, I, I love history and, and I love the, the fact that, that we look at history when we're looking at these projects. I know sometimes we get labeled as uh, destroying history when we take out one of these dams. And I, I think it's something quite different than that because Exeter, is, they were Native Americans that fished there on those banks for these fish, the same kind of fish, thousands of, for thousands of years, thousands of years before us. So, and then people from Europe settled here because they caught those fish. They caught them to use as bait. They caught them to use as food. They were dependent on those fish here. And then we entered a whole period of history in which we sort of disregarded our natural environment. Uh, and that fish that's on the shirt, that's in the, that's in the seal, it, it almost went away. And so here we are now, again, in this era, looking back 
looking back to that history, admiring what the people over the last few hundred years have been able to do, the technology, the industry, but knowing that we also need to respect that previous history, that, that ancient history, in order for us to truly, truly have a, an ecology and an economy that can work together. I would say I, I actually totally respect anyone missing an old structure, um, without a doubt, anywhere, whether it's a building, a dam, or a structure. But in this case, we had a situation where, A, a dam was not meeting dam safety standards, it was not good for the environment or fish, and it was costing the town money. This was an opportunity to meet many of those priorities at a local, state, and federal level. Um, and without a doubt, the site is still loaded with historic structures all around the site, and we've actually restored something that was here for 10,000 years since the last glaciers is a beautiful waterfall. So we still have the sound. It's actually more sound than it used to be. This will actually have a sound um, that will start to grow on people. It already has. Um, I've heard from a number of people. So this, it will become the new historical setting without any significant damage to all the historical beautiful structures in downtown Exeter. We have all the photographs. We have all the maps. We've left some things in place. Whether they will last another 400 years, you know, will the headworks survive their 400 years? Um, I think it's just going to be a matter of making sure that we keep it in the forefront, um, keep the business district remembering that's, that's what was there. We still have Water Street. Water Street, it's named for the water. Um, we still have Great Bridge, which is sort of named for the Great Dam. So all of these, these uh, place names and these bits of, of social history are still in place. I think, I think we won't forget the dam. Um, it's interesting to me that we now have new generations of children who are going to be here when the dam is not here. I was speaking to a, a class over at Phillips Exeter Academy in January, and I realized I was about to launch into this, but you know the dam is not there, and I realized that there's a whole group of freshmen who arrived last fall who've never seen the dam. So it is going to change the town a little bit, and they're going to have to listen to all of us old fogies going, well, I remember when there was a dam here. You whippersnappers don't remember that, but we always will. So I think we just have to keep it in our heads. The memory you have of the dam is a wonderful memory, and it's a memory of your childhood. Don't, don't dismiss it, don't, don't, don't leave it. But look at what we have in this place and embrace that also. We all grieve at the loss of something that we've been around for our whole lives. Uh, I know that oh, I grew up in a place that was rapidly, rapidly developing. And I remember the, play, the fields I used to play in are now covered in, in pavement. That change is something you grieve. Well, the same is true for the built environment. If, you, if we lose a big building that we like, that we walk past every day, they may build something new there, but you're grieving that loss. And, and I really sympathize with the folks who have walked over that dam, who fished in that pond, who recreated around there who've seen this as part of kind of who they are as a town, they should, they should grieve. We should all grieve for that. But we should also be really excited. And I think this is what I would encourage people in a town who, who are grieving, is to look forward. That past hasn't gone away. We have to keep telling that story. I think that that's part of the, the interesting thing about dam removals, is that you have to tell the story of the dam in order to tell the story of the restoration. So we don't have the restoration without that long history. And so I think that we, we're all gonna speak the same language. There's gonna be some people who are more excited about the restoration. There's gonna be some people who are less excited about the loss of that dam. But together, you're telling the story. And I think this is telling the story of both our past and our future.